Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get uh, started in just a minute. If you haven't collected your uh, lunch, do so, grab a chair. We've got a terrific program. Uh, my name is Sunday Nathan. I'm uh, from the University of Chicago. I'm joined by my co-moderator, Dr. Dan Burkhoff from uh, Cardiovascular Research Foundation, and an all-star panel uh, from uh, from across the country, Dr. Nadia Sutton from uh, Vanderbilt uh, University. Also down there, Dr. Barbara Basir from uh, from Henry Ford, Dr. Marcus St. John from uh, Baptist Health, South Florida, uh, Miami, and uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry Estep from Boone um, Clinic, uh, Weston. Um, so, you know, we'll get started with uh, with the agenda. We do have a little bit of time built in to, to take questions and and comments. And uh, the focus of this uh, program is. SSO2 and uh, the, sort of an open-ended question, can uh, supersaturated oxygen uh, stem the tide of uh, heart failure? Uh, first speaker will be uh, Dr. Jerry Isak. So as I mentioned, you know, any opportunity to highlight heart failure, especially in the link of ST elevation and my, is a, is a tremendous opportunity. I have a four-fold goal. I want to define the burden of heart failure in 2023, highlight the implications of STEMI on heart failure outcomes, provide a little bit about clinical risk factors associated with heart failure post-MI, and importantly, put forth this concept of early initiation of disease-modifying therapy to minimize heart failure progression as a key opportunity. And so in 2020, 2023, heart failure remains common, costly, and lethal. Um, based on the latest heart disease and stroke statistics, now a little over six and a half million patients with heart failure in the United States. It's staggering in terms of cost, which I won't go into, but in terms of the morbidity and mortality for these patients, um, even more staggering with over a million hospital, hospitalized patients annually. And as exemplified on the upper right-hand side of the screen, um, the percent of patients uh, 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 based on percent of population, um, it's estimated to be about 3% in 2030 but you can see a prevalence as high as over 7% in those over 60. And what's very worrisome, when you look at the national vital statistics data, exemplified on the lower right, and look at county level hazard uh, death rates for heart failure, going from blue to red being uh, worse, in the more contemporary era, 2011 to 2018, 86% of all counties in the United States experiencing increase heart failure death rates. And it's not only in the elderly over 65, but in patients between 35 and, and 64. Now, it remains true that ischemic heart disease accounts for the majority of, of, of heart failure. And we've learned that from um, landmark publications in the past. And we're concerned about coronary artery disease and disease progression, but also sudden cardiac death. And coronary artery disease accounts for the majority of sudden cardiac death. So there's a real opportunity to um, alter this unfortunate trajectory. And specific to post-ST elevation MI worrisome observations, the heart failure incidence post-STEMI can range from anywhere 4 to 6% up to as high as 28%. And when you look at uh, the Swedish cohort, Canadian cohort, certainly in keeping that one in four to five patients can develop heart failure not only during the index hospitalization, but out further out, you know, certainly at uh, one year. And very worrisome in those that are older, the in-hospital heart failure um, incidence is three-fold higher. And based on the Dutch multi-center um, experience, including over 1,300 patients, while they did report a lower incidence, mortality was twice as high as you would expect in those with heart failure compared to those without. And developing heart failure even after that incident event, more than three days, a 40-plus percent higher mortality risk. And Greg Stone and colleagues um, demonstrated that in those patients with a greater infarct size, this is a pooled analysis in 10 primary PCI randomized control trials, those with the greatest quartile or burden of, of infarct, more than 29%, had a several-fold increase in all-cause mortality or heart failure hospitalization. And even with prompt PCI, about 50% of uh, patients have an infarct size greater than 18%, and that's a two-fold increase in cardiovascular in all-cause mortality or hospitalization. So very worrisome, and it's not only about death and heart failure, both worrisome outcome uh, uh, adverse events, but stroke and the dysrhythmia burden, 
that can be associated with akinetic and dyskinetic myocardium. This is a particular patient post-MI with an EF 31%. You can appreciate the overt LV remodeling. Now, hospitalizations for us are very concerning. This is in general. And after one hospitalization, median survival about 2.1 years, and when you fast forward five years, whether it's heart failure less than, with an EF less than 40% or mid-range or EF uh, preserved, heart failure, hospitalization, and five mortality as high as 75%. And while we certainly know post-STEMI that heart failure, one in five patients, fast forward over five years, maybe prevalence as high as 71%, and particularly in the elderly, that was from Justin Ezekowitz and colleagues, um, there is an opportunity to better study this in terms of hospitalization, post-ST elevation, and my post-index event, and the long-term implications. We would be worried that those outcomes would be poor. So certainly predicting heart failure is an opportunity based on not only understanding infarct size, but biomarkers that reflect wall stress, um, above and beyond systolic and diastolic dysfunction, microvascular obstruction, the clinical risk factors, I won't go over all of them, but are exemplified here, the elderly, female, I mentioned those two. Um, predisposed to greater heart failure after MI. And so all patients with heart failure certainly would categorize as stage C. We'd follow the standards. During the incident event, we certainly promote ACE and MRA and, when appropriate, beta blocker and up titration. But I think the real opportunity is in all patients with ST elevation and MI, they're at risk for developing heart failure, and that's stage A. And working hard to prevent the syndrome would be key. And so when one takes a step back and looks at the factors associated with heart failure, I've mentioned infarct size, adverse LV remodeling based on decrement AF. I think there's a real opportunity to improve upon the microvascular dysfunction, which is associated with um, um, post-MI um, heart failure phenotype. And we use this to reflect the um, trajectory of heart failure, the peaks and valleys. And as a heart failure specialist, avoiding that first trough and potentially modifying the disease would be a real opportunity. And so decreasing the burden and the mortality and the costs based on a team approach, which is the current stance um, that many of us uh, promote in terms of even preventing heart failure from developing, let alone treating it, is the key. And so take home points, heart failure, despite contemporary effort, remains common, costly, and lethal. Coronary artery disease and MI remain a leading cause and one in four to five uh, STEMI patients uh, uh, may develop heart failure. And the opportunities include leveraging a forum like this to close knowledge gaps, uh, understanding infarct size, adverse remodeling, and importantly, implementing strategies to avoid the syndrome altogether would be key. Appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Any, uh, any questions? We have time for maybe one or two questions. So those of you who don't know Dr. Eastep, Dr. Eastep is the, the chairman of cardiology at Cleveland Clinic Weston, but also extremely prominent heart failure physician and coming at this talk from a heart failure perspective. But, but Jerry, um, as speaking now as the chairman of cardiology, how can you encourage your interventionalists to get involved with this kind of therapy and recognize the importance of doing everything possible to minimize infarct size um, you know, with this kind of this kind of treatment. Yeah, so Dan, I, I, one, thank you for the compliments, but uh, I think it's a true opportunity to understand and leverage that point in time. Certainly one wants to consider all the important aspects of delivering this therapy, understanding the resource utilization, the cost implications. But in the end, Cleveland Clinic mantra, patient is in the center, providing the greatest quality for the greatest outcome and benefit. And so if there is an opportunity to minimize heart failure, hospitalization, improve long-term survival, certainly we're leveraging these other surrogates, then we think it's well worth it. So I think it comes down with recognition, closing those gaps, um, and understanding that it's well worth it for that individual patient. Um, and all the downstreams uh, benefits at a hospital system level should hold true, right, in terms of minimizing that morbidity and that implication for that patient. So. So I think it's talking and, and bringing everyone uh, t together. And you know, this is not just a interventionalist, uh, interventional cardiologist implication. It's an implication yeah. for, for 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 the team. And so approaching it as such, I think, would would be important. And and, and is the opportunity. Because really, once the patient leaves the lab, right, that's it. I mean, right, you're kind of left with what you've got there. If you don't address the problem acutely, it's not going to happen. Agree completely. Okay.
Any questions or comments at all? Okay. So why don't we uh, move on? Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, let's move to the next uh, presentation, which is going to be by Nadia Sutton, who's at uh, Vanderbilt University, and she's going to talk about predictors of outcomes in stemming. Nadia. All right, thank you so much. Um, before I get started, actually, unfortunately, I'm sorry, Jerry, I have another compliment for you. So uh, when I was uh, organizing grand rounds at the University of Michigan um, a year or two ago, I asked uh, Keith Aronson, our um, director for heart failure transplant, who we should invite for heart failure to give grand rounds. And I got one name and one name only, and that was Jerry Estep. So I mean, I think that I would just uh, second Dan's comments as a, as a leader in the field of heart failure. Um, it's great to um, uh, hear that you still think that trying to reduce infarct size is a priority, which is good to hear. All right, so here are my disclosures. Um, so um, overview and learning objectives. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about predictors of outcomes in STEMI, um, which actually could be a whole uh, talk unto itself, um, but just essentially focusing on um, things that could potentially reduce um, the likelihood of poor outcomes for STEMI patients that could be targeted with SSO2 therapy um, or supersaturated oxygen therapy, um, mainly infarct size, microvascular obstruction, and microvascular dysfunction. So um, when we're thinking about outcomes um, for patients with STEMI, there's um, definitely different buckets. You know, some things, patient factors, age, their comorbidities um, that they're coming to us with um, that have accrued over many years. Um, and then there's presentation factors, so some of which are related to the patient factors, but you know, how long did they wait until their, um, you know, how long did they wait with their symptoms before they came in? Um, I know that we've talked a lot about Georgia Bloom um, times ad nauseum and, you know, data here and data there, depending on how sick the patient is, it takes them longer to get to the cath lab, we know that. Um, treatment factors in terms of, you know, how, how, what is the quality of the care that the patient's receiving, um, some of the technical factors in the cath lab. And some of these are things that we can really target and try to improve um, the out outcomes for our patients. And some of these things, um, at least at this point, we don't have the technology to be able to reverse the patient's age, um, are, are not necessarily considered to be intervenable. Um, so we do know from prior studies, and I think that this will be discussed in um, additional talks um, today, so I won't go into it in great detail, that we do know that supersaturated oxygen therapy uh, reduces infarct size after anterior MI. And, you know, the reason that this was FDA approved for this indication is because the FDA recognized that um, infarct size has such a significant impact on patient outcomes that they accepted that as the um, outcome and approved the therapy. So um, increasing infarct size, as we actually, I think this is the same um, figure that we just saw, um, is associated with poor outcomes. So the, the, the greater the infarct size, um, the worse the patient does, and that makes complete sense um, to us uh, logically. Um, but ultimately, we do know that sometimes even when we get, um, you know, the, the blockage open um, with primary PCI, that we still don't have a good uh, clinical outcome. Um, the patient, you know, either is continues to be hemodynamically unstable or they have a pretty significant infarct size. So why does this happen? Um, so we think that this is probably happening um, uh, largely due to microvascular dysfunction. Um, obviously, you're going to have some uh, cell death, um, but in, in some circumstances, we may still actually have some cells that might have been viable, but we lose them due to uh, impaired microvascular flow. And this can happen for from a number of different reasons. It can be mechanical or functional, and I kind of go into that in a little bit more detail on the following slides. Um, we do know that microvascular dysfunction is associated with um, adverse outcomes post-PCI in patients with STEMI. Um, in this particular study, this is actually a meta-analysis, but um, typically we've defined microvascular dysfunction um, for patients with MI as uh, an IMR greater than 40, which is different from our cutoff in stable ischemic heart disease, where we would usually use 25. Um, and we can also quantify microvascular obstruction by cardiac MRI. This is some work done by Suzanne Duwaha and her group. Um, it was published two years ago. Um, and essentially, um, using MRI, we can see um, that, you know, there's got the orange sort of rim. That's the, the hypo-enhanced area of microvascular obstruction. And the hyper-enhanced area is the remainder of the infarct area um, in the yellow. Um, so we can actually do some quantification by MRI. Um, and so, you know, just to kind of think back, I know this is uh, really reaching back for some of us, um, thinking about capillaries, very small, 
um, typically just created you know, of the endothelial cell, and then the endothelial cells have these tight junctions under homeostatic conditions, but our red blood cells need to pass through these little um, capillaries in order to you know, get to the tissue um, and actually um, have an oxygen exchange across the capillary wall. So there's lots of opportunity there for things to go awry. Um, so how does no reflow and alterations of the microvascular bed actually happen? This is actually an older figure, but I think this really nicely summarizes all of the different things that can happen. You've got your capillary lumen. You can actually have endothelial swelling and endothelial blebbing into the lumen that can actually obstruct blood flow. Um, you could actually have um, ex external uh, compression of the capillaries by the swollen myocytes. You have microemboli, which is something that we think about. Um, you can actually have Rolo formation from the red blood cells. Um, and uh, of course, we have other things like uh, neutrophils and, and fibrin and platelets, all of which uh, sort of consort to impair blood flow for our patients that we're trying to uh, restore blood flow to. So there's a lot of different things that we're, um, we're actually um, struggling against as an interventional cardiologist that we can't even see. Um, so um, as far as the pathophysiology, as I just um, explained, all of this re results in reduced cellular energetics um, and um, impaired oxygen delivery. Um, and then, of course, in the midst of all of this, we have cells that are dying, releasing ATP and ADP into the extracellular space, and that actually sort of perpetuates all of this platelet activation thrombosis and inflammation, which just makes things worse. Um, so ultimately, um, what we're trying to do um, is obviously restore blood flow. Um, and try to um, keep our sort of capillary bed and our endothelial cells happy um, and, and provide it with as much blood flow as we can. Um, so the microvascular obstruction, um, we do know that that, as I um, showed in, in the prior study with MRI, by MRI has been associated with increasing infarct size. So the more microvascular obstruction that you have, the more the bigger the infarct size you will have. Um, and then, of course, the increase um, in the um, mass of the microvascular obstruction is also associated with poor clinical outcomes. So how does supersaturated oxygen therapy actually work? Um, uh, it's uh, been looked at in preclinical studies as well as in um, some um, sort of translational studies. But what we think is actually happening is reduced endothelial and myofibril edema, increased oxygen delivery, um, and possibly a paradoxical reduction in oxygen free radical production, uh, which is probably the thing that comes to mind for most of us. You know, we think about oxygen, we think about patients with ARDS, and they're, you know, we're told we don't really want them to get a lot of oxygen, but perhaps we do have um, kind of a sweet spot with this particular therapy in terms of having it be transient enough that we can actually restore some of the mitochondrial function um, and actually preserve some of the uh, microvascular flow. So um, this is just some data from um, the preclinical pre models um, when they were calling the supersaturated oxygen intracoronary aqueous oxygen, demonstrating that um, this actually uh, did better than just sort of even um, the auto reperfusion, meaning like just allowing the, flood, the blood flow to come back, or active normoxemic perfusion. So it's not just the um, sort of flow that's actually improving it. It's actually the, the oxygen content being higher that actually was what um, improved um, the myocardial flow. So um, just to summarize, um, we do know that microvascular obstruction is associated with increased infarct size and poor clinical outcomes in patients with STEMI. Um, most of that work has been done using MRI. And that we do know that microvascular obstruction um, sort of occurs through the process of endothelial swelling, neutrophil plugs, and platelet aggregation. And we do know from our uh, preclinical work and from our clinical work that uh, supersaturated oxygen reduces infarct size in patients with large uh, my myocardial infarctions particularly those um, presenting within six hours of symptom onset, um, and that um, supersaturated oxygen does improve microvascular function in preclinical studies. So thank you very much. So we do have some time for some questions. Any, anyone have any questions? I think I can ask a question to you or your to the panel. Um, uh, you know, MDO is getting a lot more attention than in the research area in interventional cardiology. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can make a comment about, if anyone can make a comment about techniques for assessing MDO in the lab. Uh, obviously, we can use uh, MRI, but that's not, that's not helpful um, in kind of a therapeutic window. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about what's happening in the research area and whether some of these techniques might make it into clinical practice? Um, yeah. So. Um... Yeah. So right now, um, the main um, option for invasive 
with regards to the function testing is using Oracle to add system because um, uh, Phillips is uh, working on revising their system at the moment. So um, that would be the way to do it. Um, and so we would have to have it integrated into your cat lab. And actually, it's, uh, it's very straightforward. You essentially just put the pressure wire down. And ultimately, you could use that same wire for an extension if you wanted to. Um, the uh, current protocol does use um, adenosine. Um, and so I think that that would be something that would have to be sort of further evaluated or sort of thought about as perhaps maybe in the TMI setting you might want to do it without adenosines. Um, but yeah, I'd be you know, interested in hearing what others say, but I, I, I think that it would be very feasible to do it. Um, I just think that we need to have more volume and experience and opportunities to do it. So. <laughs> You know, I think uh, not just the fact that we're writing but it's really the only real option that, that we have currently. And I was just going to add is that all the interventionalists know sort of the, the poor man's um, assessment of microvascular obstruction is, is how does that myocardial blush after you've opened the vessel? So I think the example that you showed where it was the, the epicardial artery was open, but the blush was, was terrible. So in that case, you, you know that there is, there is uh, a lot of microvascular obstruction. I think in the real world, that Probably our best signal, but not a, not a good one. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next uh, talk is going to be by Robert Sear, and he's going to give us a summary of the clinical results with, uh, with success of tip. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for the uh, team for having me. Um, just by a raise of hands here, how many of you are um, structural heart interventionalists? Oh, much less than I expected, actually. It was interesting. We had a discussion just prior to this, and Andy was involved in it, and we were talking about different call structures um, and who's taking call these days, and are the structuralists getting out of calls? And for the most part, they aren't. And really, it's about uh, the idea that you know all of us um, have had interests and care for STEMI patients. And what's surprising to me year in and year out is um, how few people actually know that we have an FDA-approved technology to reduce infarct size, despite all of us individually doing this, um, you know, and taking care of these patients every single day. So these are my disclosures, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the evidence behind supersaturated oxygen. And so SSO2 delivers um, supersaturated oxygen, which is seven to ten times of normal oxygen, into the ischemic myocardium. And just as Nadia mentioned earlier, you don't get, you know, oxygen-free radical damage. In fact, if you, in an animal model, if you measure the coronary sinus oxygenation or oxygen saturation, it's going to actually be the same. If you measure your ABG, that oxygenation is going to be the same. So it's not systemically delivered. And so it's an infusion catheter, a diagnostic coronary catheter that's made by Boston Scientific that has been tested so that it doesn't create any bubbles as the oxygen is being delivered. Uh, and it's a therapy that's delivered for 60 minutes after the anterior um, MI. It's the only approved technology that we have to actually limit infarct size. And the mechanism of this is essentially to restore uh, microvascular blood flow by reducing edema and injury um, to an area that we don't normally think of, right? So we use IV antiplatelet agents, we perhaps do aspiration thrombectomy in certain cases, we try to give vasodilators to try to optimize our epicardial blood flow, but then when we talk about microvascular disease and dysfunction, which is probably one of the leading um, reasons for developing an infarct size, as was mentioned by Nadia, the, the way that we measure that on MRI is uh, microvascular obstruction. Um, and so it becomes something that's nuanced, right? Something that we can't control. And that becomes really, I think, a, a problematic area. And now we have a therapy that can potentially uh, reverse that and help our patients. And it's not just theoretically, right? You can actually see this on an electron microscope and you can actually see decreased endothelial swelling and better uh, um, uh, mitochondrial reactions uh, within at the cellular level. And so we know that this is actually uh, working within these patients. And then there's been a slow and steady increase 
of clinical data to suggest that this is something that can be beneficial for our patients. So it start, first started with a pilot feasibility study, the AMI-HOT1 trial, and then uh, to the pivotal trial, which was the AMI-HOT2 trial. And this was a randomized control trial in a two-to-one fashion, basically randomizing patients uh, with a 90-minute infusion of SSO2, which was later than an AMI-HOT3 reduced to 60 minutes, uh, through a diagnostic catheter and measured infarct size based on nuclear studies. And so the first objective was to um, study effectiveness, and I'll show you in the next slide that it reduced infarct uh, sizes by a, a relative risk reduction of about 26%. And then the other um, important component was to make sure that it was something that was uh, safe and that was also uh, demonstrated to be effective as well. And so that's essentially what the um, led to the FDA approval of this device, right? Uh, and so there was a 26% reduction in infarct size. And it's, again, just very um, interesting to me that when we talk about all of the different therapies that have ever been studied to reduce infarct size, that we've actually only had one positive trial within this space, and very few people sometimes know about this. So I applaud you all for attending this and, and, and learning more about this and hopefully implementing this within your institution. Institutions. One of the things that was most surprising to me as you dig a little bit deeper within the data actually is, is that you think to yourself, you know, who's going to benefit the most is probably that late presenter, that, that person who, you know, uh, came in 18 hours or the patient who actually had no reflow. And that's actually not the case. If you actually look at the uh, sub-studies from AMIHOT1 and AMIHOT2, what you actually find is, is that the greatest benefit comes to the patient who presented early, who you're able to restore epicardial blood flow because those are the patients who you can deliver the supersaturated oxygen to the best. And so, for example, if you have a patient that presents with within three hours, their infarct size reduction is significantly higher at 41%. If you already develop TIMI 2 or 3 flow, Pay those patients tend to do even better and have a higher uh, infarct size reduction. And this is kind of counterintuitive to us. And so one of the things that's challenging once you bring this into your cath lab and once you start to talk to your partners about this is, is that the simplest cases that we do, the radial PCI, six French, wire balloon, stent, post dial, uh, IVIS, and be done, those are the patients that actually benefit the most. And now you're gonna add an hour of supersaturated oxygen to be able to help uh, reduce their heart failure um, for the rest of their lives. And I think that's an important point when you're talking to your lab staff or your fellows who are like, God, why are you making me sit here for an hour? Is that you really let them know what are the manifestations of heart failure. You can give them a, a guideline directed medical therapy talk on heart failure during that hour as well. So it's not just about um, uh, infarct size as the only surrogate that we actually have. We actually have um, observational studies that have actually shown that you do get to the harder endpoints of um, uh, um, um, better um, restoration of normal LV function, right? And you reduce um, uh, pathologic LV remodeling within these patients as well. And so I think that the, the idea and the principles are there. The only problem that we have right now is we don't have long-term studies to essentially prove and show to us um, that it actually reduces heart failure hospitalizations or improves survival. But I think we have a host of uh, trials that are in the works that will help answer this question. And so I'm heavily involved in the ISO-SHOCK trial along with Dan, and we're going to randomize patients to supersaturated oxygen versus standard care across um, patients who present with cardiogenic shock. There's the AMI-HOT3 trial, which is going to be looking at patients treated with SSO2, but will now use more contemporary MRI to be able to identify uh, patients' um, infarct size. And then something I'm really excited about, uh, the real SSO2 registry, which is going to be looking at patients' Uh, and, and how they're being treated in current practice so that we can get contemporary data on different outcomes as well. So an exciting area for us, lots of work to be done. But to conclude from my standpoint, this is something that all of us 
take care of, right? Whether your favorite thing is trying to put a clip on a tricuspid valve or to pr try to put a new stent in the IVC and SVC to geeks like me who like to put in a lot of hemodynamic support devices, no matter what we do at the core of our practice is STEMI care, right? And so we have to ask ourselves, other than being able to treat these patients quicker, what tools do we have to be able to improve their outcomes? And I think supersaturated oxygen is an underutilized tool um, to be able to help our patients. So I'm excited to talk to you guys more in the discussion and thanks for your time. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes? Why not begin the perfusion during the intervention? Why wait till the end? Why not go to seven French sheets and do it, catheter and do it at that time? Oh, so you need to be able to restore the epicardial blood flow first. So you stabilize your lesion, you... Yeah, you first build it, but you have some flow down there. Why not start perfusion then while you're finishing your case and get a 15, 20 minute jump on it? Well, I don't know if the 15, 20 minute jump makes any difference. I think what's probably, I think from a safety standpoint as well, you, once you've stented, you've trapped your thrombus behind, you've, you know, uh, optimized your stent as much as you can. And so that's the way that it was studied. I, I think your, your just getting at it from the perspective of it might be more efficient from a time saving standpoint. Is that kind of? Well, we're going to go with a seven French catheter. We put it up. Why, I just don't understand why you'd want to wait and do it at, at the end. Yeah, it does as soon as you have some flow, you can get the supersaturated oxygen down there, and at that point, begin reversing the process. Um, I mean, the only one thing is that um, it does have to be given through the specific catheter that the FDA approved, um, just because it was felt to be safe. That was a safe catheter to use. So I don't think you can give it through a regular guide catheter while you were intervening. It's going to be something you guess an access point. Yeah, well, that's the question I would have technically. Technically, if you wanted to, could you? deliver it during you're doing additional work in the, uh, in the coronary? I would be nervous about it. I mean, I think introducing air in an active system and going away from all of the techniques that we've learned from such a long time. I mean, after you've ballooned, I mean, you're talking about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, I don't know if that difference is, is a lot. 25% of what time you're going to do it after the procedure. It's 25% of the time. It's not like 5% of the time. I would think that, I mean, for me, as a non-interventionist, I mean, the question would be technically, can you, could you do it, and whether or not. Technically, you probably could, um, but. The, 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 doesn't the catheter I mean, have to be, it has to be into the left main? Yeah. So is the guide catheter that you use for PCA, is that Why not in the left main? Why not guide catheter that you use for that, do your PCI with, but you're already going to know it's an LAD lesion by the EKG when you go to the lab. I think part of it is just a technical aspect. You're trying to do the procedure, you know, balloons in, balloons out, stent in, stent out, all the while trying to have the incision down the guide catheter. I think it's just, yeah, you can, you can do it, but I think it's just technically difficult to do it when you're exchanging, uh, you know, exchanging equipment in and out, and shooting the x-ray dye down and so on. So you probably can do it, but it would be you know, kind of intermittent because you're flushing it all the time and putting stuff in and out and so on. But you're, Point is that you're right, it's not clear it's going to make much of a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other, any other questions or comments? Um, I mean, I have one other uh, follow-up question for you, which was bit, built on something that you mentioned, um, that, you know, when you're introducing this into a new uh, program, um, you know, you, you made the point that, you know, the patients that, that are maybe the simplest mm -hmm. to do technically are the ones that might benefit you know, the early presenters that doesn't have you know timmy good timmy flow uh, early on. Um, the tendency sometimes when introducing a new therapy is actually to try it on the sickest patients mm -hmm. and not and to say well this patient's going to do well and um, you know as I'm I'm going to try this first I'm going to do a real sick patient you know someone who came in late who has a massive MI and is in shock and this and that. And then we'll see how it goes, and uh, and then maybe we'll then do it in the less sick patients. Um, we see this in heart failure a lot. When that happens, the therapy can get killed. Mm -hmm. So I think um, building on what you said about you know the patients who the thing is important to emphasize 
when thinking about introducing this, that you do want to do it on label in the patients who will benefit the most and not view this as a bailout, a bailout procedure. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Constantly? Definitely. I think it, that's the concept that we have to keep reminding ourselves of. And uh, I think that goes a long way. What's interesting is, is that Jay Travers has some good data from Minneapolis um, where he's actually taken some people with that, that were late on a younger side of the age because he was really worried about um, heart failure down the road for these patients. And he's had really good follow-up and outcomes even in those patients as well. So a lot more to learn. Great. Okay. So, yeah. Do you think a lot of people are going to cherry pick their cases? Um, I, 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 That's I, the I point. I love the therapy, totally believe in it, but we have so many ways of practicing medicine. My patient doesn't need it, they're doing just fine. What you don't see doesn't hurt you, right? Yeah. Do you think it'd be better to have a timeout after every STEMI? Is this a Therox patient? Because if, because if you have that algorithm that we're doing everything, just like a, a common heart team approach, mm -hmm. right? Is this a Therox patient? And if so, yes, you start. Because if you roll this therapy out and you let 10 different interventionists decide who and what and why and where, it's like Impella. When Impella came out, nobody knew how to use it. Everybody was afraid. They, they said they only used it for the disaster when they needed it, right? Oh my God. <laughs> my, no. okay. It's like Impella. And Pella took such a long time to adopt because people, us, we weren't educated, advised on how to use it, the right patients. Because if you use Impella on the wrong patients, we get ischemic legs, right? We get more adverse outcome from a bleeding standpoint, vascular injury. So I think if we educate the interventionalists that this is for every STEMI patient, from this spectrum to that spectrum, the benefit is there. You're going to have better adoption, better utilization, and we'll all be united. There's so many differences of opinions, yeah. and the therapy is going to take off. It's just a matter of adoption. It's like electric cars, right? 10 years ago, you would laugh at me if I said 90% of the market shares are going to be EVs. This is going to take off, but if everyone is united on some way, mm -hmm. that we all do it for the patient, not because my patient's going to do better, this one had an excellent blood score, asymptomatic, ST changes are down. So many reasons not to use this therapy. But if we only know that the benefit is there, that is more meaningful than to decide of who should not get it. And you don't see the manifestation sometimes till later. One of the things that helped us in our institution was we started to get more cardiac MRIs, right? And we saw the microvascular obstruction, and we saw what these patients were going to be dealing with down the road. And I think that helped convince and change people's um, perceptions a little bit. Good. I have a question, but just a uh, comment to his comment. We've all seen cases where we open the artery in an hour, and six weeks the ventricle is trashed. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people come in 12, 24 hours later, you open the artery and you know the ventricle comes back to normal. But forgive my ignorance on this question, how do they come up with this concept that super levels of oxygen it, it, you know, does this uh, improve this technique rather than just normal levels of oxygen? What was the bench work that went into this idea? And whoever came up with it probably ought to get the Nobel Prize. I mean, this is just fantastic. But how did they come up with the bench work to say, wow, you know? Um, right, so that's that's obviously a long discussion. <laughs> and, um, and we don't have time to go into detail, but Dr. Spears in, um, in Detroit came up with the idea. And it's really based on alleviating uh, the endothelial ischemia, which leads to all the things that uh, Dr. Sutton uh, discussed about endothelial blemming, endothelial swelling, micro uh, uh, my myocyte swelling and compression of, of the micro uh, microvasculature. So that was really where it came up. It's not really uh, uh, to get more oxygen to the myocytes per se directly but it's really to alleviate the endothelial ischemia and, and relieve all of those, uh, um, all that, that microvascular obstruction that's not due to distal thrombosis and neutrophil clogging, et cetera. So that's really where the idea came up with and it was based on you know, a very systematic uh, investigation. So that's the short answer. Okay, now we're gonna hear about um, uh, we've heard about the um, uh, reduction in infarct sunrise, 
And now we're going to hear about the implications of reducing infarct size, at least one of them, which is to improve ventricular function. So Marcus St. John is going to talk to us about real world evidence of SSO2 therapy impact on LV function. Marcus. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so I think a lot of what I'm going to say is also going to dovetail on, on some of your questions and, and what the real world experience is with this therapy. So my version of the real world is uh, Baptist Health South Florida, which is a big employer. It's, it's comprised of 12 hospitals from, from Boca Raton down to the, to the four of the Keys. Baptist Hospital is the flagship hospital in, in Miami and sort of a tertiary referral center and an early adopter of, of this therapy. Um, I think one of the biggest and most important ways of getting your staff, your colleagues to buy in is, is to have a local champion. So it would be someone like you. In our case, it was, it was Dr. Quesada. And, and you have to present the data. People have to believe in it. And, and over time, the staff especially really become the biggest advocates. They're the ones asking, well, is this a patient that, that we should do this on? Because they start to see the outcomes. So when you share your own data, then, then the buy-in starts to, to get there. So, my summary statement from the outset is that this is doable in the real world, sort of community-based hospitals can do this, and you're going to see improvements in your patients' outcomes. Much of this has been talked about already from the previous speakers, but the value proposition of supersaturated oxygen is that it fills that unmet need of unchanged outcomes of death and heart failure in anterior STEMI patients post-PCI. And so the the, the graphic on the left shows that we've we've done a good job. There, there are better outcomes now because of door to balloon time and all that, but there's been a steady, unchanging level of late outcomes that that suggests that opening the artery alone is not enough. As Dr. Sutton and, and others have shown, microvascular dysfunction impacts infarct size, impacts adverse LV remodeling, and ultimately impacts LV function. And, and why I think it's important that LV function is at the end of that, of that string is because it's something that we can measure. Uh, everyone who does medicine uh, knows what the EF stands for. Patients know what the EF stands for. So it's something that you can say to your colleagues, to your staff, to your nurses, to your techs, look at the improvements in EF that we're going to get. Um, and I think that's really how you get buy-in for, for this therapy. So I'm going to start with two um, cases that highlight our process, and then I'll, I'll briefly show you what, what our data is, and uh, then I'll wrap it up. This was our first uh, SSO2 patient. It was June of 2021. This was done by my partner, Dr. Ramon Quesada, uh, who's, who's a big believer and was, was our champion. So a 53-year-old man who presented with an anterior STEMI. Interestingly, even for the very first case, so as, as you may know, the audience should know, it's FDA approved for LAD STEMIs presenting within six hours. This gentleman had stuttering symptoms of 12 hours duration, um, but that, that didn't stop him. But um, I'll show you briefly the, the film. So he had an occluded LAD with some collateral filling from the right to the LAD, and that becomes important because what it said to him in the heat of the moment, that was the clinical scenario. The, the symptoms were sort of stuttering. There weren't 12 hours of crushing chest pain that he expected there was viability in that anterior wall, and, and that, that's what led him to offer the therapy to this patient once he'd opened the occluded artery. You can see from the catheter uh, location that he uh, did this from a radial approach. These uh, images here are right after the SSO2 therapy. So again, blush is not everything, but what a beautiful blush. And you can see the anteroapical and apical hypokinesis, EF probably 30 to 35%. I don't have all the echoes for, for these two patients, but uh, the very next day, we see an improvement in the LV function. Still not normal. There's some apical septal hypokinesis, but it, better than it was the, the day prior. So that was our first uh, patient, uh, still doing well, and um, has had complete recovery of LV function uh, months later. This gentleman was 42 years old, presented more classically within two hours, uh, had VTVF in EMS, or as, as we say in South Florida, fire rescue. Um, he was brought to the lab by another one of my, my partners. Um, no, no visible collaterals here, and occluded proximal LAD there. The wire's already down. Here we see, after stenting, another lovely blush. And again, the interventionists in the room will know that you don't always see that blush. Now, these are two cases, two anecdotes, but, but you know what? Many anecdotes make, make a real story. Also very significant LV dysfunction. Next day, com 
completely normalized LV function. I mean, look at that apex. It, it's just a wonderful thing, a 42-year-old man. So you, you have some cases like this, and then you show your own data, and the staff believes. So uh, each one of us wants this for our patient, and the notion that doing an extra hour to get this is somehow an inconvenience, it, it really is laughable. Um, so I think these are the ways that you teach your colleagues and your staff that this is why we do what we do. So our data is, is shown here, and it was presented in abstract form at, at this meeting. Um, and I'll just walk you through it. This is really the, the meat of the, of the talk. So in the green is the standard PCI-only treatment, and we did sort of a, a contemporaneous look at 22 patients uh, around the same time as, as our, our SSA2 program was, was beginning, who got just usual standard of care. In the blue bar, we see the SSO2 patients who were treated within the FDA-approved uh, and indicated guidelines of under six hours. That was 22 patients. And then in the dark blue are SSO2 patients who were treated after six hours. And I think that was only six patients. Um, and what you see is that the first month um, in the PCI-only treatment, so the, the standard of care, get, get to, the, the, to the lab, you open the artery, you put your stent in, we saw a percentage increase in the EF of 3%. Whereas in the SSO2-treated patients, the EF increase, the percent increase from baseline um, pre-discharge to one month was 16.8%, and for the greater than six-hour presenters, 15%. So sort of dramatic, noticeable, eye-catching uh, results uh, that held up to three months out. Um, so in the PCI-only group, 5% increase from baseline in EF at, at three months. 23% in the SSO2 treatment group under six hours, and in the greater than six hour group, again, a small number, uh, 22%. Uh, importantly, we didn't see any hint of negative outcomes, 0% stroke, 0% need for ICD implants, 0% rehospitalization in the SSO2 group, uh, and no mortalities and no reinfarctions. Um, I'd point out here also, just to, to give you a flavor of the real worldness of this, so at Baptist, at Baptist Hospital in Miami, there are a total of eight interventional cardiologists. Uh, six of us now are employed, two are non-employed, and the, the second case that I showed you was of one of our non-employed partners. So the, I, I think really what you need is a local champion, um, and once you have a good leadership and a strong champion, even folks who may have less incentive to spend more time at, at the hospital will, will really buy into this therapy and and uh, avail your patients of, of this opportunity. We're going to look in our uh, hospital at trying to get a little bit more data around the later than six-hour presenters. And the, the thought is that patients who have established uh, collateral flow at the time of their presentation, whether it's at eight hours, 10 hours, or in the first case I showed you, 12 hours, that that presence of collateral flow may be an indication that that muscle is viable and likely to improve. Um, and so in those patients, after, of course, standard of care, opening the artery, we'll, we'll try to, to, to randomize them into just standard of care or then to do SSO2 if they presented later than, than the current FDA-approved uh, indication. Gratifyingly, our data is very consistent with other real-world sites um, that, that have supplied data to, to Zoll. So uh, here we see uh, in other institutions, so ours is, is Hospital B, um, but similarly uh, impressive increases in ejection fraction from baseline at one month, so 15% through 20%. And in the, the uh, sites marked with, with that orange positive sign, no, no, no reported, reported uh, readmissions. And this data and this trend holds up till three months out. Um, so very encouraging data that certainly is consistent with the initial trials and we hope to, to see um, continue to be shown in the real SSO2 um, registry. So in closing, intracoronary SSO2 infusion at the time of primary PCI for LED STEMI results in statistically significant improvements in LVEF compared to standard PCI alone. I think that is the headline here. And if, if you take nothing else from, from this conference, that should be it. What else do we want for our patients but improved EF? Um, and further, in, in, in our particular uh, setting, in patients, that, that benefit holds in patients presenting both within the currently approved six-hour window 
as well as patients presenting late and who have collateral circulation. Dr. Saint John, you would not let a normal EF mimic you in using this, would you? I mean, we're talking about yeah. I, I would still use this on somebody who did not have a wall motion on their mouth. I, I would also, um, and they may have less to benefit, but I think any benefit uh, when, when you have the, the opportunity is, is, is probably worth it. Are there any other um, additional questions? I mean, it kind of gets back, you know, your comment here from before kind of relates a little bit, like, you know, should every patient with an inferior stemming get this therapy? So the way, obviously, the way medicine advances is, is we do a clinical, we're supposed to do a clinical trial, a randomized trial, we get a result, and then the results, you know, we interpret the, you know, the limitations of the study, and then we apply the therapy if it was shown to be beneficial. So kind of technically, anyone who meets the criteria for the AMI-HOT and the IC-HOT uh, study would, would qualify for this, uh, for this kind of therapy. So, um, you know, there was no, as I remember, there's no EF criteria for either of those, either of those trials. In, in most cases in our, in our STEMI practice, we, we do the EF at the end anyway. So I, I, would, I don't usually know what the EF yes. is before given the, the treatment, to be honest. Question from the back? Yeah. Um, so one of the things you brought up So in your experience, what sort of practices have you set up in your lab that make the best work as possible or that make things more streamlined? Yeah, um, you know, you, you, you can't make 60 minutes less than 60 minutes, but um, I think communication is is the most important thing. And by that, I mean the moment that you have in your mind as, as the interventionist, this is going to be an SSO2 patient, share that with, with the team. So when I'm seeing someone in the ED or, or even if just on the phone from the from the ED doctor, I'll send the text to, to the group. This is an SSO2 candidate. Um, so they already have in their minds, all right, we're going to do the PCI, then we're going to do the the, um, the additional time. What, what some of the staff have said to me, um, they have a lot of other things to do. So the nurses have a lot of catching up to do with their documentation and, and those types of things. Certainly as a physician, we, we have a ton to do in terms of dictating, speaking to families, putting in orders. So I'd say at least 30 minutes of that time is, is used just doing other stuff that you would otherwise have to do. It, it's not um, no extra time, but, but it's a lot of stuff that gets done in that time. So this is going to be, in part, the topic for the next talk. Yes, you're right. Um, so we can really uh, maybe dive right into that, which is another question. So the next talk is going to be uh, from Dr. Sandy Nathan, who's going to talk about how to initiate SSO2 program. I think some of these types of, of uh, practical questions will will be addressed. How do I get, so do I get one here? Get you into there, just a second. Okay. Dan, thank you so much. Apologize, I had to step away for a little bit. So I'm going to talk about. Um, sort of the nuts and bolts of initiating uh, an SSO2 program. Here are my disclosures. So this is what I sort of regard as the blueprint for setting up an SSO2 program. This is what we sort of followed um, at my institution at the University of Chicago. Um, I won't bore you with sort of the, the data. Uh, you've already heard that. I, there's a lot more to discuss, but really just kind of drill down on uh, understanding the value proposition of SSO2. Uh, some of the capital uh, equipment and disposables and how you navigate that, and then uh, team training and actually just getting the case done. What are the practical issues associated with getting that uh, case done? Uh, but I think it starts with sort of an objective assessment of what actually improves outcomes, morbidity and mortality in STEMI. Everybody has their sort of favorite balloon, their favorite scent, their favorite whatever, but if you really drill down on what actually improves outcomes, it's primary PCI versus fibrinolytics, it's potent PTY12 inhibition, Door to balloon less than 90 with the recognition as, as we get better and better with door to balloon, we're not seeing the commensurate benefits in terms of uh, outcomes. So national D2B is like 62, 63 minutes. We're not worlds better than we were when we were 80 minutes. Uh, early revascularization versus medical stabilization in AMI, in AMI shock, radial versus femoral, complete revas, and then GDMT. 
So the value proposition is simple, as has already been highlighted by the previous speakers. One in five STEMI patients at least go on to develop heart failure. Uh, SSO2 therapy has been shown to restore microvascular flow and reduce infarct size to a substantial degree and also lower heart failure and mortality in uh, uh, treated patients versus versus controls. And uh, the mechanism of action can be sort of simplified into to a couple of uh, concepts. The three potential mechanisms, most prosaic explanation is the diffusive effect of superoxygenated plasma, uh, independent of RBC traffic, reduced endothelial cell edema, and mitigation of free radical injury. Um, and so the objective reasons, just to kind of bring it back from where uh, Dr. Estep started, uh, the objective reasons why SSO2 could potentially offer significant incremental therapeutic values that STEMIs like cardiogenic shock are not going away anytime soon. There's been a shift in STEMI and non-STEMIs, but uh, there's still plenty of them to be treated. Uh, anterior STEMIs, as we all recognize, are uniquely dangerous, and the most impactful aspects of evidence-based therapies are finally starting to reach their individual therapeutic ceilings, and so there's not a whole lot more to squeeze out of the things that we're already doing. And on the side of the, the therapy itself, uh, implementing very complicated therapies becomes very tough. So the recognition that SSO2 is cheap, simple, and effective is important, and it fulfills a therapeutic niche that's largely under-recognized and at the moment totally unaddressed. The magnitude of reduction that we're proposing here actually, you know, falls in line with many other, uh, you know, therapies that are in the pipeline, including uh, door to unload if, uh, if that pans out and, and many other strategies that we're looking at. <laughs> so on to the equipment. So the capital purchase is this. Uh, if you purchase it or get it through uh, a, uh, you know, a bundle uh, with the number of disposables that you order, it's the console. The console takes a, an oxygen tank, any standard oxygen tank goes in the back with a minimum of 800 PSI. These are the disposables. These are all the SKU numbers, and uh, we keep a decent number of, uh, of the uh, purpose-built uh, seven French merit sheets, as well as the, um, the uh, cartridges and uh, various uh, shapes and sizes for, uh, for delivering the, uh, the therapy. Setup and use is uh, dead simple. Uh, the mobile console is primed, the cartridge is inserted, uh, and then uh, make wet-to-wet -wet connections, uh, as I'll show you here in just a second. I don't want to geek out on the science of it, but the science of it is really interesting, how you actually uh, supersaturate uh, uh, um, saline, basically create aqueous uh, O2, uh, and don't have bubble nucleation as it's actually being dripped in is, is fascinating. And so there's a lot of uh, very interesting uh, technology that, uh, that yielded uh, this complete system. For most of our cases, uh, we've done uh, all of our cases. We've done femoral access with uh, ultrasound guided puncture and a seven French uh, sheath at the end. This is the sheath, as you can see. the The sidearm is substantially larger than the sidearm of a standard uh, introducer sheath, and so that amount of flow requires a sidearm that large. If you are uh, using a, a radial approach, a minimum of a five French radial sheath for the outflow, for the return, as well as uh, for uh, drawing off uh, the, sac the um, oxygenated, excuse me, the, uh, the arterial blood in a five French femoral sheath is, uh, is what's uh, necessary. And the two configurations are uh, shown here. I'm happy to share my slides with anyone who uh, wants to see them. Um, Prepping the patient, uh, very simple. Uh, essentially, uh, attach the draw tubing to the sidearm of the seven French sheath. Make sure that you've got this four-way stopcock uh, for ACT draws without interrupting therapy. Uh, and uh, the port is pointed down and then make a wet-to-wet -wet connection between the return tubing and the five French catheter uh, that's positioned uh, in the left main. If you forget, or it's been a while uh, between cases, if you uh, scan the QR code on the machine, it pulls up the video that you see here. And in about three minutes, you can refresh your, uh, your memory as to, as to how to set this up. So setup for this uh, system could not be any easier. Um, and then I think, you know, to get into some of the questions that I think were uh, starting to come at uh, Dr. St. John, how do you actually sort of get your uh, staff in the, in the mindset of, uh, you know, doing this efficiently? Start prepping the minute you uh, cross with a wire and you're up with a balloon. The minute your uh, your clock is stopped is when you should be prepping this machine and just letting everyone know what uh, what's going to happen so that there's a seamless transition to uh, to therapy. So, you know, during a, a, a radial uh, primary PCI, uh, just for fun, we uh, we kind of scribbled down because it was uh, disagreement as to how long a radial versus femoral case takes. So we scribbled down on the bloody drape exactly when everything was happening. And you could see that uh, the entire case from start to finish from uh, lidocaine to uh, final images was about 31 minutes. But it does leave about 15 minutes from the time of balloon inflation to case completion, IVIS optimization, 
leaves about 15 minutes to, to get everything uh, set and ready to go. And then, of course, when therapy is completed, uh, it'll let you know that uh, it's time to end the procedure, disconnect all the equipment and so forth. A question that frequently comes up is, how can you best utilize your 60 minutes post-PCI? It's kind of a drag to stand there at 2 in the morning for another 60 minutes. But the reality is that it's not like the bed is ready, that everyone's, you know, uh, ready to uh, receive that patient in the ICU, at least not in our center. Uh, there is definitely uh, some additional work that needs to be done. So generally what we will do is we'll break away uh, the minute SSO2 starts uh, happening and team members will go take care of other issues so that uh, in the end, the incremental uh, time expended on this is not the full 60 minutes. So speak to family, finish orders, uh, case dictation, review the CTs for the three perks uh, that you received while you were uh, uh, whiling away uh, your time in a, in a STEMI, drink coffee. Um, but very importantly, make sure that the catheter remains positioned uh, and you check ACTs every uh, 10 to 15 minutes and keep that ACT above 250 seconds. And so the last thing I'll say, if, uh, if all of the prior talks and the science and the outcomes and so forth haven't been persuasive enough, the last thing I'll say is that we willingly spend time on improvements in post-PCI outcomes every single day. If you're doing it right, you're using intravascular imaging, physiologic testing for intermediate lesions, invasive hemodynamics and PA catheters and cardiogenic shock, lesion prep, sometimes many, many minutes to hours of lesion prep and uh, imaging in complex and calcific uh, CAD, CTO recanalization, and MCS uh, uh, and, uh, and unloading. These are all things that we willingly accept. I would submit that SSO2 uh, sort of falls in that, in that same bucket of things that we should be thinking about for anterior STEMI. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. And, um... We've run a little bit over just a minute or two, so maybe if there's any uh, questions or comments from the audience or from the panel about this therapy, it'd be great to uh, great to hear. Any anything in closing? Just, uh, no? Any further comments? I think we heard uh, you know we heard about the, um, the the rationale for this, the need for addressing microvascular obstruction. Um, we've heard the results of clinical trials. We've seen the results of real-world experience in consistent improvements in left ventricular ejection fraction. And we've heard finally about, you know, starting a program. You have a question, comment? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for all your presentations. Um, definitely exciting technology and something that I feel like a lot of centers will benefit from. One of the obstacles that hasn't been addressed this is how do you push this through your value analysis committee. So cost is a big issue um, in preliminary discussions that we've had internally. And I can only surmise that a lot of other institutions would also come into, from a hospital administration standpoint, as well as even amongst even community members, how did you, how, um, did you guys push it across your hospital administration would have a lot of cost concerns about the therapy and um, how you navigate that. Well, I, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think we have been lucky at, in the Baptist system that we have a very supportive uh, administrative leadership structure. So I think once, once it was clear that the physician's office was a valuable um, thing to, to have it, it, and that it helped patients, I, I think the leadership uh, in our center has been really on board. Um, uh, the, the SOL team also provides a lot of support in terms of making sure that, that we're building and coding optimally. Uh, so it really has, has not been a, a uh, cost moving type of uh, development once, once we got up and running to the new experiences. I was just going to comment that the team for Therax is really helpful and has some creative solutions, I think, for having some of those discussions. I know, um, having gone through it now at two institutions, um, I think every institution is a little different, but um, they do have some different ways of um, sort of presenting packages, financial packages that I know administrators actually appreciate having options. <laughs> Uh, I, would, I would echo uh, what uh, Marcus and Nadia uh, said. Um, you know, th there's uh, RBU and reimbursement associated with this. So the, 
worst case scenario, you're helping patients and remaining cost control. That's the worst case scenario. Typically, you end up, you know, uh, problem. Um, but I think, it, you know, it starts with sort of a frank discussion of what we're actually trying to accomplish here. And there are many things that we use that we just, you know, I mean, IBIS, IBIS is very poorly reimbursed. IBIS for, you know, transplant with allograft vasculopathy, which is part and parcel of, you know, surveillance in our institution is very poorly reimbursed. Um, so there are many things that we do and, uh, you know, our value analysis team is, is very understanding about that. And it says, look, if you think this is the right thing to do, so long as we're not, you know, burning through cash to do it, uh, it's, it's fine. It, it was surprisingly not that hard to, to get this approved. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, to all of the uh, uh, attendees and, uh, and speakers. Uh, thank you so much.